over to you. Thank you so much, Heike, for the warm welcome and the introduction. And thank you, Kit and Heike, for sharing our session. I'm really excited to be here. And it's an honor and a delight to share my thoughts with all of you. Um, before I start, just some brief notes. I'm going to share an access copy in the chat right now if anybody wants to read along. So give me a second to do that. Let's see if that works. Oh. Actually, I can't. Uh, I'm wondering, Heiko or Kit, if you could do it. Apparently, I'm not allowed to share something in the chat. I'll do it. That's Thank no problem. You. Thank you. Uh, and the second note is that, I, unfortunately, I'm calling you from a very tiny uh, device today, which is very prone to crashing. So I decided not to make a PowerPoint. And I hope you can bear with my face and my voice um, for the time of the talk. So yeah. Um, before I start, uh, I want to recognize that today I'm speaking to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and the Sanch First Nations, whose relationship with the land continue to this day. I'm offering this brief territorial recognition to highlight not only the colonial history of this place, but also to acknowledge the ongoing colonial practices that allow me to be here as an uninvited guest, as well as to voice my support for indigenous peoples and First Nations struggles across Turtle Island to defend and reclaim their land. With this in mind, I would like to direct our attention to the other side of the globe and towards the geographical focal point of my research, the relatively small Western European country of Austria. Unlike my current location, where there's a growing awareness amongst settlers and a deep knowledge amongst indigenous peoples about the way colonialism and genocide a prerequisite for the Canadian nation state, Austria still grapples with recognizing its colonial past in the first place and is far from re readdressing the colonial, the colonial wounds that leak into the present. Comparable to other German speaking countries like Germany and Switzerland, the dominant narrative still frames Austria as neutral and non involved when it comes to the histories of colonialism or the transatlantic trade in humans thus rendering the ways in which Austria has profited from colonialism, enslavement, and genocides unspeakable. This form of repression provides, as Belinda Kazim Kaminsky notes, a fertile soil for haunting. While a comprehensive argument about the many ways in which contemporary Austria is haunted by its colonial ghosts would be a different paper, what I would like to aim for today is to think through how these hidden colonial histories, their global entanglements, as well as their ha the hauntings they produce relate to what we might call trans histories. But the very notion of trans histories holds many tensions. Whose histories are we talking about? What counts as history? And how might we access these stories today? I will address these questions in a moment. But for now, I want to share with you the remark by historian and trans studies scholar Perry Persson Baumgartinger, who wrote that, and I'm quoting, the history of trans people and trans movements in Austria is a largely unwritten, submerged, and forgotten history. How does he come to this conclusion, and how does it relate to the questions I posed before? As a non-historian and someone who works across many disciplines, my first impulse when I started my research on trans histories in Austria at the turn of the previous century was to seek out archives focusing, focusing on queer histories, believing that everything I was looking for was just a folder away. In short, I was imagining the archive to be a neutral repo repository, ready to reveal those histories to anyone who came to access it. Now, those of you who are historians or have been working on the history of sexuality or the history of any marginalized group really, might only have a wary smile for my naivety. I was, in Anjali Arondeka's words, still seduced by the archival promise, desiring, desiring the romance of recovery and retrieval. I quickly had to realize that this promise does not hold. To complicate and illustrate this a bit further, I want to turn to an encounter I had early on in my research with an archivist from the Queer Archives in Vienna. I had cont contacted them inquiring about their records relating to trans histories in the early 20th century. However, the response I received illuminates the very limits of my own archival desire. The responsible archivist, who himself is a renowned renowned histor historian of Jewish and gay life in Austria, gave me a two-folded answer. First, he informed me that trans phenomena were largely absent from their archival record, suggesting that the historical period I was interested in was, and I'm quoting, more preoccupied with pedophilia than variations of transvestitism. Nevertheless, he then pointed me to his own work on Adele, 
a figure he described as, quoting, a balloon salesman in women's clothing. In 1926, Adele became the linchpin of, inflama of inflammatory reports by the Viennese Night Press, a bi-weekly journal which described itself as independent and apolitical. In a series of defam defamatory articles, the press constructed Adele as an imposter and a sexual deviant who tricked beautiful young and otherwise straight men into queer sexual encounters. In the violent heteronormative imaginary of the press, Adele's otherness was further evidenced by the sway of her hips and her high-pitched voice. The Viennese night press even claimed to have recovered Adele's real name as well as her address and publicly, publicly exposed them. Subsequently, the person named by these articles defended themselves against these accusations in a series of letters to the editor, denying any connection between them and Adele. Nevertheless, the Viennese night press held on to their claim, even threatening to expose further ex information. The hate campaign led by the press was so successful that the person named in these articles was later eventually incarcerated. In his response to my inquiry, the archivist who himself had recovered the story of Adele offered his research to me while simultaneously adding his doubts about the possibility to understand, and I'm quoting, his identity through a framework of trans terminology. My initial, my initial reaction to this, his skepsis on the one hand and the ease with which he assigned Adela as male on the other was one of disappointment, irritation, and even outrage at what I felt was simultaneously a dismissal of the existence of trans life in the past, of trans histories, historicity, as well as an attack on the leg legitimacy of my own research. Of course, it was neither, or at least not necessarily. I'm not sharing this encounter to prove that the archivist's assessment of Adela is inherently wrong, nor do I want to reduce him to a straw figure in an argument about false or at least competing identificatory claims, or to make an attempt to pit gay histories against trans histories. Neither do I wish to devalue the importance of his work or his, resp res his response. On the contrary, I believe that his response, as well as my effective reaction to it, invites a valuable mediation on archival desire, impossible subjects, and the limits of the archive. You may have noted that while I felt enraged by the archivists assigning Adele as male, in my own writing about Adele, I alternate between she and they. While this is certainly a conscious, conscious choice, it still leaves me uneasy. How can we respectfully address and recognize a subject whose only self-testimony in the archive is a denial of identity? In other words, how can we think about Adela when the person identified by that name claims Adela has never existed in the first place? Confronted with the, this violence, a counter archival reading of Adela might turn to the violent classification of Adela, uh, classification Adela was subjected to, and read the objection and negation inscribed into them as, I'm quoting, the very sign of the now trans signification following Rebecca Edwards' methodological, methodological suggestion, suggestions for a trans archival reading practice. Why such a counter archival reading would try to counter the absence of trans narratives without necessarily attempting to restore a fully knowable historical subject in its place, it still turns to the restorative promise of the archive, even if only through reading its negation. Reaffirming the belief in its restorative capacity, the archive remains privileged as the site of historical inquiry par excellence. It still promises. To come back to my encounter with the archivists, it seemed indeed impossible to claim Adele as a trans subject. To do so would not repair historical injustices. Rather, it would mean to subject Adele to another order of violence. In other words, as much as we might desire to claim Adele as a historical trans subject, Adele remains an impossible subject indeed. We cannot wrest Adele from the violent discourses which construct her in the first place, and we cannot know who or even if Adele was. As it is entirely possible that Adele lived only in the imaginary of the Viennese night press and its readers. Also, it becomes clear that the desire to find and identify Adele as a, as a trans subject in the present is not too different from the press's and later the state's effort to identify Adele as a sexual and gender aberration in the past. Archival desire as a longing for community across time, which Heather Love has described as a central component of doing queer and trans histories, is not innocent. What then does it mean to engage these archives 
How can we conceive them beyond the frameworks of knowable subjects and identities? And how can we, re how can we reimagine the archive beyond its promise of recovery? And how do these questions relate back to the colonial ghosts I invoked at the outset of this paper? While I agree with the hesita hesitation of the archivist that Adele cannot easily but be identified as a trans subject, I do believe that trans, not as a marker of an univer universalized and cross-temporal identity, but as an analytical tool, has the potential to address these questions. Following recent developments in, tr in trans studies, especially Black trans studies and trans of color critiques, I understand trans as a form of critique or hermeneutic rather than a specific sub subject position within the archive. As Marcus Bay has argued, simultaneously suffix and prefix without a root, trans with an asterisk, asterisk has, a, has once, sorry, with an asterisk at once opens ways to think about a variety of transitive and transgressive movements and entanglements that are not exclusively attached to gender and its white Western bourgeois inflection. The asterisk does not only destabilize trends, opening it up to multiple attachments and rela relationalities beyond white gender, but it also symbolizes the unspoken or rather unspeakable. Phonetically, the asterisk is unvoiced. Scratching in the throat, it refuses to be spoken as dominant culture does not provide a language for its vocalizing. As we try to speak the asterisk, the glottis closes, literally preventing sound to escape. Thus, the asterisk is swallowed by its own unspeakability. But queer and feminist linguistic interventions into gendered languages, such as German, for example, also taught us that it's possible to recognize the closing of the glottis, to hear the silence of the asterisk, and to understand it as a signifier of a story untold, an impossible subject position within dominant language. In this way, the asterisk following trans becomes a steady, re steady reminder of the silenced yet fundamentally constitutive, in Saidiya Hartmann's words, asterisked histories of colonialism and transatlantic enslavement, rendered impossible by the violence of the archives. In her text, Venus in Two Acts, Hartmann uses this term to think about the ubiquitous presence of Venus in the archives of transatlantic slavery and the impossibility to tell her story beyond the violence which the archive attests to. She writes, I'm quoting, the story that exists are not about them, but rather about the violence, the excess, mendacity, and a reason, and reason that seized hold of their lives, transformed them into commodities and corpses, and identified them with names tossed off as insults and crass jokes. The archive is, in this case, a death sentence, a tomb, a display of the violated body, an inventory of property, a medical treatise on gonorrhea, a few lines about a horse life, an asterisk in the grand narrative of history. I'm especially, I'm especially intrigued to think about the asterisk as a marker of both access and silence, a signifier of a story untold and impossible to tell. Attached to trends, the pointy fingers of the asterisk touch and reach beyond the confinements of, the, of a clearly marked identity and maybe even beyond the archive itself. Thus, the question becomes not so much who is trans history's proper subject, rather confronted with the limits of the archives, trans moves beyond the binary of reading with or against the archive, understanding it as either full or empty, searching for presence or absence. Instead, using trans as an analytic in, instead of a descriptor for a subject to be found and recovered in the archives, the archives appear as a site of global entanglements, multiple crossings, fugitive traces, and asterisked histories. In other words, instead of asking if historical figures, if a historical figure has been trans, using trans as an analytic has the radical potential to unearth the violent conditions, global entanglements, racial grammars, and processes of desubjectivation, which allow for the emergence of transgender as a modern subject formation. A common feature of trans historical projects focusing on the early 20th century is to engage the archives of European sexology and criminal criminalization. As Julia Patterson has pointed out, the reliance on medical archives within trans studies has magnified the whiteness of transsexuality, while simultaneously obscuring the racial conditions under which trans phenomena become knowable in the first place. Additionally, these archives, sorry, these archives largely absent the, constitu the constitutive role of colonialism and transatlantic enslavement, not only for the formation of the modern gender order in Europe, as post and decolonial feminists such as Maria Lugones have long shown, but also for their, for their transgressions. However, in the case of Austria, those archives, 
marked by whiteness and constituted through colonialism and the atrocities of modernity are largely lost today. Many of their or original records destroyed during World War II and the Shoah. This is especially true for medical and sexological archives in Austria. But as the case of Adele might have shown, even the large archive of historical newspapers that remain seem to be empty when looked at under the lens of subjectivity, only marked by violence, loss, and negation. How then do we engage those seemingly empty archives and the apparent impossibility of writing trans histories in Austria that Per Person Baumgartigan pointed to at the turn of the century? To quote Anjali Orondeka again, can an empty archive also be full? Reading the archive not for its lost subjects, but for its entanglements and asterisk histories, a different story might come into view. While reports on figures like Adele are extremely rare, and in the context of the Austrian press in the early 20th century, mostly places them as outsiders to the empire or the new, newly established nation state, popular, popular newspaper articles about so-called artificial sex changes started to erupt, erupt in the early 20th century, but they were brimming with another rather unlikely object when thinking about trans, trans histories. They were brimming with an abundance of rats. Rats were the raw material, raw material used by Austrian biologist Eugen Steinach in his experiments on the physiology and mutability of sex and gender at the Bio Biologische Versuchsanstalt, the Biological Experiment Department in Vienna from 1912 until his displacement in 1938. His theories on so-called sex hormones and artificial sex change became a central point of reference for the medical discourse on, of, trans, of transsexuality, which fully emerged approximately 30 years later in the 1950s. Steinach's personal archive, his library, as well as his research materials were destroyed in March 1938, shortly after the annexation of Austria, when the still young Republic became part of the German Third Reich. The Biologische Versuchsanstalt, where Steinach used to work and which was an independent research facility where many Jewish researchers found refuge from the growing anti-Semitism at the public universities was closed in 1938. The researchers expelled and the building itself bombed during the fight for the liberation of Vienna in 1945. Steinach was forced into Swiss exile where he died in 1944. Therefore, Steinach's traces in the archives today mostly encompass his own scientific publications as well as numerous articles in daily newspapers and popular science magazines about his research, as well as its literary and cinematic adaptations. To quickly summarize, Steiner's theories and experiments were built around an epistemic object, which he named the puberty gland. According to Steiner, this gland is part of the ovaries and testicles, but has no reproductive function. Instead, its purpose is to determine, develop, and stabilize sex, gender, and sexuality over time by secreting, by secreting an invisible substance into the bloodstream, the so-called sex hormones. But before those hormones were chemically isolated, Steiner himself tried to prove their existence by transplanting the, the so-called puberty gland of a female animal into the abdominal cavity of a castrated male animal. After this organ transplantation, Steiner claimed to witness a complete feminization of the animal, proven not only by changes in its fur, size, and skeleton, but also by its sexual and gendered behavior. What Steinach developed was, in short, a theory of the plasticity and malleability of anatomical, anatomical sex as well as gender, as he argued that the feminized animals sorry, were indeed individuals with a complete female sexual character and psyche, nursing young animals like a mother. Located in the Venice Prater, a former imperial hunting ground, Steiner's laboratory was part of the surrounding culture of spectacle. While the building itself was built as part of the Vienna World Exhibition in 1873, a massive event representing Austria, or rather the Habsburg monarchy, as part of the collective European colonial project, it was repurposed as a research facility at the turn of the century. Nevertheless, it remained surrounded by colonial spectacles, such as human exhibitions, sideshows and other stagings of racialized otherness under the guise of popular science and entertainment. As geography of science, to borrow from David Livingstone, these surroundings influenced Steiner's research as well. 
Not only did he work on artificial sex change in rats and guinea pigs, but he also investigated the role of climate in the development of sex by comparing his findings with rats held, held in terminal cages to writings of colonial anthropologists. Conjuring up colonial a colonial fantasy of the tropics, he argued that higher temperatures lead to a less distinct development of sex difference in the human population of the colonized lands. Framed as a victory of science over nature, a sure sign of progress and modernity, Steiner's experiments in, gained a widespread popularity and were taken up by the Austrian as well as international newspapers. Reports on the successes of artificial sex changes in animals were ubiquitous in the media discourse between 1910 and the late 1920s. As John Meyerowitz and others have shown, these articles were crucial in offering an imaginative space for people to construct and reconfigure their own identities. Which is not to say that trans life has not existed before and continues to exist outside of this medicalized understanding of sex change. Rather, Steiner's experiments allowed for a specific subjectivity to emerge, one in which gender and sex appeared as plastic and malleable, and glands were considered the key to understanding the remodeling of the self. Nevertheless, these subjectivities can only be traced at the fringes of the archive in the clinical and pathologizing reports of psychiatrists and sexologists who described their patients' de desire to undergo the same kind of glandular transplantation as Steiner's critters. However, if we follow the rats, the rats zigzag through the archive and consider the multiple histories their traces cross, it becomes clear how the idea of artificial sex change was embedded into a racialized narrative of sex change and was deeply entangled with Austria's involvement in the Re European colonial project. For when the archive is no longer scoured for its lost subjects, but instead read for, read for its lines of flight, asterisk histories, and historical entanglements, it, sudden, it suddenly no longer appears empty. Instead, the archive is littered with the corpses of numerous animals whose traces wind, wriggle, and crisscross their way through the archive. Against the hier hierarchical order of the archive, their traces lead in all directions, connecting to different archives, making visible rhizomatic networks while their nests undermine traditional taxonomies and shake up binary classifications. Their paths burrow into numer numerous unknown openings from which they escape when no one is looking. Within that underground network, sometimes the rats slowly morph into the silhouettes of other figures who are barely recognizable. Therefore, following the rats' traces might allow us to catch a glimpse of those whose silence has swollen into a loud asterisk. To illustrate this, for the remainder of this presentation, I would like to draw your attention to an article published in 1926, the same year that Adele was persecuted by the Viennese right night press. And the article is entitled, The Rule of the Glands, uh, in German, Die Herrschaft der Drüsen. Written for a popular scientific magazine, the author, Georg Löwenstein, a German sexologist, aimed to explain Steiner's theories to a lay public. His argument touches upon different kinds of glands and their roles in the human body. He exemplifies their function by turning to so-called abnormalities, which he ascribed to malfunctioning glands. Throughout the text, he constructs these abnormalities by calling upon a, divi a, sorry, a diverse range of popular freak show figures, sexual deviants, and malformed animals bound together in a curative imaginary. This alone already might point to the ways in which science, popular entertainment, and the staging of otherness were intertwined in the early 20th century, as well as to how the borders of the modern human were haunted by disability, gender, sexuality, and animality. I'm especially intrigued by the pictures used to illustrate the arguments in the article and what histories and entanglements, entanglements they reveal. I would like to argue that it's, that it's been that it's not by accident that opposite a picture of Steiner's feminized guinea pigs, we find a popular lith lithography of Julia Pastrana, a Mexican indigenous woman and sideshow performer who at the time of the article's publishing has been dead for over half a century. However, while she died in 80, 1860, her human remains were exhibited in an anatomical museum next to Steiner's research facility until the early 1920s. Her objectified body was a set piece of the colonial spectacle which characterized the Viennese Prater at the turn of the century. Tracing the ways in which Julia Pastrana's body was understood in terms of race, gender, disability, and animality or humanness, I argue that she eliminates the racialized grammars of hybridity and plasticity that Steiner's research on artific artificial sex change relied upon. In life and in death, Julia Pastrana, whose non-Christian name has been erased from the historical record, 
was violently exhibited due to her perceived racialized and gendered and gendered and dehumanized ugliness. Born with abundant hair on her face and body, Julia Pastrana became an international spectacle in the mid 19th century. Staged as natural curiosity, freak, and ultimately a hybrid between human and animal, the pre darwinian missing link, she was exhibited in sideshows and circuses around US, the US and Europe. When she came to perform in Vienna in the winter and spring of 1857-58, her act as Julia Pastrana from the Mexican desert, in which she, she sang and danced, was so popular that it was extended twice. As disability studies scholar Rosemary Garden Thompson has argued, in the eyes of her spectators, Julia Pastrana constituted an ontological dilemma, troubling the very categories of sex, gender, race, and humanness that the order of being relied upon. Efforts to assign a fixed gender to Julia Pastrana were constantly undermined by her dehumanization as she was regarded as a nondescript and non-human monster, a human animal hybrid, a hermaphrodite and a bearded lady. When she arrived in Vienna, the local newspapers announced her as a half woman or as the girl with the monkey head, as a mixture of human and orangutan, not granting her full personhood and constructing her humanity as hybrid and defective at best. As Sunava Taylor has argued, as a disabled indigenous woman, Pastrana was marked by identities that had long been subjects of objectification, study, display, and animalization. Even though I would like to add that I think it's, as with the other markers of identity, we have to be cautious to assign contemporary concepts of disability to Pastrana's life. Interestingly, though, the construction of Pastrana as a bearded woman, which today is often attached to her history, as well as the question whether she was intersex only emerged after her death. This shift from outright animalization to understanding Pastrana's body along the lines of sex and gender pathology is closely tied to two paradigmatic shifts. The first shift took place within modern medicine and enabled a new understanding of bodily difference in terms of pathology rather than curiosity or monstrosity. And monstrosity. Rosemary Garland Thompson has described this shift as one from wonder to error. The second shift was a shift in how human history and the human itself were understood and was crucially enabled by the emergence of Darwin's theory of evolution in the late 19th century. Specifically, Darwin's theory of natural selection provided new grounds to think about the significance of hair and the lack thereof as hallmarks of sex differentiation, which in turn signaled the advancements of species and race by the evolutionaries on the evolutionary scale. In other words, as Kimberly Hamlin has argued in her genealogy of bearded women, while in white women, facial hair became a sign of disease, bearded women of color were presented as racial, represent as racial representatives eliminating evolution at work. Thus, despite the shifting framework, we can see those efforts to assign a fixed gender to Julia, Julia Pastrana were persistently undermined by her dehumanization, animalization, and racialization. Or to turn this her around, her humanity, whether she was considered non, sub, or semi-human, semi was underwritten by her presumed gendered hybridity and unfixedness. In addition to her performances, Julia Pastrana was also subjected to medical examinations by numerous so-called medical experts. In Vienna, she was presented to Dr. Siegmund, a renowned race, race theorist whose medical report was published in a popular newspaper. While Siegmund attested that Julia Pastrana was a mestiza, a result of racial mixing and indeed a woman, thereby rejecting theories around her being an animal-human hybrid and incorporating her, within, incorporating her within the normative order of race and binary sex, he nevertheless described her as a so-called transatlantic curiosity, whose appearances seemed other than human. Only in passing, the medical report mentioned that Pastrana initially resisted any manual examination, thus foreshadowing the violence of the examination and crucially also Pastrana's resist resistance to it. It is indeed almost impossible to recover Julia Pastrana as a subject from those archives. There is no picture of her everyday life, no record of the things she, no record of the things she said that is not fabricated or distorted by the violence of those who wrote it down. Ultimately, there's no glimpse of who Julia Pastrana was in her own terms. We cannot know the life she secretly dreamed of or the future she imagined for herself. 
It is reported that the impresario Theodor Lent, who married Julia Pastrana, presumably in an effort to bind her to him and to exercise control over her body, her performance, as well as the, the capital she sh her shows generated, would not allow her to leave her apartment in daylight in order to further excite the potentiality paying pub public. But I wonder, did she make friends during her nocturnal walks in the Viennese Prata? Did she meet with others who, like her, have been banished into the darkness of the night? Did she befriend the sex workers, laugh about, laugh about their newest gossip, and keep them company while they were waiting for the next johns under the big chestnut trees of the main avenue? Did they admire each other's self-sewn self dresses, talk about pleasure and desire while linking arms, or was she a monster to them too? Did she see the queer lovers who tried to not call attention to their giggles before they disappeared into the thicket? Was she welcomed by them as she wore, her, she wore her, her beard and body hair with pride? Did she exchange knowledge with the other sideshow performers on how to navigate the unwanted touches during the performances, trying to feel whether her hair was real? Did they laugh at the people who paid to stare at them, buying the fantasy that they were selling, or did they despise them? Did she, like the characters in Todd Browning's film Freaks, find a community of the abnormal and unwanted who recognized her humanity? Did she become a one of us instead of a one of them? And how did race play into this possible encounters? Did she leave any ghostly messages for those who came after her, whose presence as freaks and exotic exhibits in the Viennese Prater, her brief visit only foreshadowed? What would she have told them? Given that we can only fill those holes with our imagination, what does it then mean to bear witness to Julia Pastrana's life as well as her afterlife? This violence continues in Julia Pastrana's afterlife. After she died in childbirth in 1860, her body and that of her child were mummified and further showcased. Eventually, the human remains were sold to a Venice showman who continued to exhibit her human remains until the early 20th century, right next to Steiner's research facility. She was part of the colonial spectacle that, that surrounded Steiner's research facility. And as I've said before, as a geography of science, these surrounding, surroundings had epistemological effects not only on Steiner's research itself, but, as, but also shaped how it was perceived by others, as can be seen in the article, The Rule of the Glands, where Pastrana's picture appeared. It was only in 2013, more than 150 years after her death, that Pastrana's human remains were repatriated to Mexico, where she received a Christian burial. Still, before being returned, scientists in Norway took medical scan scans of her human remains and retained a DNA sample for, further, for future research. Thus, the violence against Julia Pastrana, her thingification, and the various ways in which value is extracted from her body is still ongoing. She is not allowed to rest. And I'm coming to the conclusion. Um, while I do not want to claim Julia Pastrana as a trans subject in any sort of way, as I believe doing so would just add another layer of violence to her story. I do think that the asterisk histories of Julia Pastrana, the impossibility to restore and repair her, repair her subjectivity from the archival record, and the way that her body was understood in terms of racialized and gendered hybrid, hybridity, are illuminating of the ways in which the plasticity of sex and gender became attached to different bodies in very different ways and with very different effects. So instead of claiming Pastrana as a trans subject, I propose to understand her as part of the global entanglements and asterisk histories of trans subjectivity. In other words, I want to think of her as part of the history of transness itself, of how it was shaped in both creative and violent ways. Whereas the plasticity of sex and gender in Steiner's artificial sex change experiments seemed to promise the capacity to be transformed into a newly sexed and gendered subject, for Julia Pastrana, this, the science of the glands enabled only another premise for her continued thingification, another layer of her desubjectivation. Thus, while published accounts like the rule of the glands offered utopian horizons for certain subjects to reconfigure their identities, these horizons are also haunted by the racialization of gender, the asterisk histories of animalization, dehumanization, and desubjectivation, as well as the specter of Julia Pastrana. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jonah, for such a wonderful and rich um, paper and reflection on, I suppose, archival violence, archival 
absences and, and presences. And there was so much to think about. And while people are gathering their thoughts, I, I want to take um, Chair's privilege <laughs> um, to, to um, ask 